I want to talk about <clears throat> a spoiler now, but I want to talk about bringing Harold Ramis in to mm -hmm. your finale. Yeah, it was an extraordinary process. Uh, so the first person who ever read the script for Ghostbusters Afterlife was my father. Yeah. Uh, the second person was Erica Ramis, the widow of Harold Ramis. Mm. Uh, and beyond that, her sons, her daughter, um, and, uh, uh, and Violet Ramis, who I literally grew up with on the set of the original Ghostbusters. And they've been a part of the process from the beginning. Read it, came to set. Uh, Violet came with me uh, the first time we pulled Harold's original proton pack out of storage and she put on her father's proton pack. Um, uh, they were one of the first people to see the actual finished cut. They looked at visual effects as they were being made. Uh, they, they, they reviewed his uh, Hasbro character. Uh, so they've been part of it. Most big spectacle movies end with an explosion. Mm -hmm. Like when I, you know, when I say third act, the first thing you think of is the Death Star, right? Yeah. This movie ends with a hug. Yeah. If the hug don't work, we don't have a movie. <laughs> right. Because, yes, in one way, the movie ends with the trapping of Gozer. But we've seen that before. And, uh, and we see ghosts getting trapped throughout the various films. Mm -hmm. That wasn't as important to me. The reason I made the movie is the moment in which... This grandfather who is no longer with us gets to meet his grandchildren and is forgiven by his daughter. That's it. That's why you're watching. That's why you're actually yeah. watching the movie. That's why it's like a secret me movie inside the Ghostbusters <laughs> universe. However, that only works if when you see Harold, you actually feel like you were spending time with him. The same with that the characters are spending time with them. We all know that experience of watching Force Awakens and seeing uh, which Admiral was it that they uh, recreated? Yeah, Grandma I Tarkin. Yes, yeah. and you see Tarkin, <clears throat> and and you're thrilled to see him, and you can't help yourself. By the second or third shot, you're going, "How'd they do the chin?" You know, you just can't help it. Our instinct is to look for. Yeah, no, I did it in Ghostbusters. I was looking for the uncanny valley with right. every shot, and I tell you, I couldn't find it. That's the thing that blew my mind. Yeah. And so I'm really curious about that process. So the, the artists who created uh, the character of Egon Spengler in Ghostbusters Afterlife are responsible for what is, in my opinion, the most impressive uh, virtual character that has ever been done in cinema. And that is the young Sean Young in Blade Runner 2049. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, that yeah. nothing held a candle to that. When, when Harrison sees Sean Young in her 20s <laughs> um, with the glassy eyes and the hair, um, that tone of voice and the way her lips look, it was false. Yeah. And when we reached out to them and they said, yes, this is NPC in Montreal. That was the first time I thought, oh, we might actually be able to pull this off. Amazing. On set, we had an actor, uh, an actor named uh, Bob Gunton. He performed the role on set. We needed an actor. We needed a real actor who was going to perform as Harold on set to work with the kids, to work with the original guys. Right. So he studied Egon, he studied Harold, got a, an understanding of how the, the character worked and performed the everything live. So when you were watching the body language of that performance and a lot of the facial performance, you were seeing Bob Gutton's performance. The virtual part was far more complex. <laughs> It involved creating a digital version of Harold Ramis, but not a digital version of Harold at the age we portray him in the movie, but rather the age he was in Ghostbusters 1984. Hmm. So they created a digital version of Harold in his 30s, and they edited the digital version of the 30-year-old Harold into the 1984 film. And they did that until you could watch the 1984 film and not tell that it was a virtual character. Whoa! Because that way they are comparing the digital version to the accurate version, and you could know, and you could do a side by side, and you wouldn't know which one's which. And you know what you're looking for. Once wow. they had the the digital younger version of Harold, they began to age him decade by decade. So then we saw a digital version of him in his 40s, a digital version of him in his 50s, and his 60s, and eventually his 70s. Arian Tutin, who also created our terror dog and who worked on Pan's Labyrinth, who was a genius in his own right and one of the greatest puppeteers working today, 
also created artistic renderings of what Harold might have looked like at that age. Had he been working out on a farm for the last decade? Um, you know, thinking just even, you know, Harold's, you know, hair, the, the, the hair of Egon Spengler is iconic in its own. Yeah. So understand what that would look like as it grayed, as it aged, as it was, you know, beaten down by the sun. And it was a combination of his artistic efforts, the brilliance of the people at NBC in Montreal, and then the, the sheer talent of Bob Gunton together that created the virtual Egon Spengler. I'm, I'm, I'm also loved the choice of no voice. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm curious if you were thinking about having a voice at any point or that was just a really solid decision from the very beginning. You can't sum up Harold Ramis or, or Egon Spengler in a few lines of dialogue. And my fear was that had we done something like this, I had a couple lines, it would appear as though we were trying to understand the greater truth yeah. of who Harold or Egon was in this one line of dialogue. And there is no line that can live up to that. Incredible. Well, I wanted to talk about the early relationship between the ghost of Harold and and McKenna Grace. Yeah. And I, when she says, how did you know how to do that? And the lamp goes and shines on all the diplomas. Yeah. There's something about that that was 100% Harold. Yeah. In its delivery. I'm so happy that you, you mentioned that. So my father at one point had read the draft and said, uh, this is really lovely, but you know, Harold was really funny. <laughs> and his and the ghost right now is a it's a deeply emotional, very kind and fatherly ghost, yeah. but it's not very funny. And Gil and I were sitting there going, it's a lamp. Like, how do we make the lamp funny? <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was the joke we came up with was uh, how on earth did you do this? And it made you it, again. It felt like a hug. Right. And I, we saw it at Comic-Con, so I heard the whole audience laugh at that joke, yeah. and it made me so happy because it really felt like Harold was in the room. So this is one of those days where uh, special effects wizards had been working on a lamp that could be puppeteered using these different rods, and they had been showing me different versions of the arm and how the head moved. And every time they tried to do it, it just didn't have that speed. There is a speed and a pace to comedy. And yeah. I remember finally going to the puppeteer and saying, okay, just disassemble all of that, grab the lampshade with your hand, get in there and just, and cause you have to move and, and yeah. cause there's a move to the comedy beats, mm -hmm. but then there's also, you know, if this is Phoebe's head and as a grandfather, you're coming around to see what she's doing. There's a way that you move and turn and look that say, I'm interested in what's happening here. And it, right. you're not going to do that with these rods. Like, no. hold it with your hand. We'll paint you out and it's, just come in there. And it's so funny because when you started talking about the rods, I'm like, I feel like what I saw was hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, can exactly. tell. Yeah, no, it's just it's just human. And then that's when it started feeling we were like making a movie like 1984 is when it felt hands on, when it felt like the puppeteers were doing what they were like put on earth to do. Uh, it's like the hands ripping out of the, out of the chair <laughs> yes. and grabbing them. And, uh, and there was, that was, I mean, that was kind of, you know, there's this thing of when you go through your parents' old, old possessions <laughs> yeah. and you try to understand what it was like to be your parents as kids. Uh, if you put an old baseball mitt that your parents wore as kids and you hold it and you throw a ball into it and you play catch with it, for a moment, you feel like you're time traveling mm -hmm. and you understand what it was like to be, you know, your dad or something. Um, those moments on set created this very unusual opportunity in which we were recreating actual moments from 84. Yeah. So there's a beat where Sigourney sits in the chair in 1984 and the <laughs> arms come out and they grab her. And here I was on set with an actor in a chair and the arms coming out and telling, all right, when you come out, it's got to pop out and then grab down and there's a way you do it. And actually try to imagine, wait, I wonder if my father gave that same exact direction. Like, right. was there a moment where the puppeteer went like this and my father went, no, come like this and then like this. <laughs> and if, we, if I'm arriving at the same conclusion, the same way that my father arrived at it.